When did morality first come into existence? When did it first make sense to say something like, thou shall not lie, or stealing and murder are morally wrong? How you answer this question will depend upon your view of ethics and morality in general. If ethics is about obeying the commands of God, if ethics derives from the existence of a divine being, then perhaps the answer is, ethics has always existed. Ethics is timeless, just like the deity itself. On the other hand, one might answer, we are still waiting for ethics to be meaningful, and I wouldn't hold my breath. The moral nihilist, who believes that all talk of morality and ethics is ultimately meaningless, and who denies that there are any moral obligations at all, would hold that statements like these still don't make sense. In between these two extremes is the position we have been exploring in this class, that ethics has to do with human beings, and consequently, that the origin of ethics coincides with the origin of the human species. There is something special about the human species that first brings the concept of moral obligation into existence, and first gives statements like stealing and murder are morally wrong a real meaning. But what is this special characteristic that humans possess? The universe is 13.8 billion years old. Human beings have evolved between 5 and 7 million years ago. Putting aside the possibility of an intelligent life on other planets, which I can neither confirm nor deny, that would mean that morality developed only very recently in the history of the universe. So what is it that human beings have brought into the universe that was not there previously, that was not there for the vast majority of the time that the universe existed? Some philosophers, including the 18th century philosopher Immanuel Kant, would argue that the development of the human species brought rationality into the universe. Human beings are not just another type of animal species. We are persons. We can reason, deliberate, make free choices, and imagine. We are aware of ourselves, both at the present moment and over time, and we can contemplate our finitude and mortality. These capabilities, characteristic of what Kant would call a rational being, make human beings unlike anything else in the universe. And given this fact, we might think that human beings enjoy a special status that warrants our respect. In fact, the very notion of human rights seems to rely upon this idea. Human beings have an intrinsic worth such that every human being, merely by virtue of being born a human, and independent of any other facts about ourselves, like our gender, race, religion, or social rank, deserves to be treated with dignity and respect. In this video, we will explore this idea of respect for persons and consider the philosophical basis upon which it is grounded. Just like beneficence and justice, the ethical principle of respect for persons is based upon a fact about human nature. Whereas beneficence is founded upon the fact that humans are embodied, and justice is founded upon the fact that humans are social, respect for persons is founded upon the fact that human beings are rational. And as Newton points out, the moral theory that places the greatest emphasis upon the rational nature of human beings is found in the work of the philosopher Immanuel Kant. But what is the significance of rationality? Why does the fact that human beings are rational imply that human beings have a special status that warrants respect? To answer this question, we first need to have a better sense of what Kant means by rationality and what he thinks rationality allows us to do. Consider the following famous passage from Kant's Critique of Practical Reason. Two things fill the mind with ever new and increasing wonder and reverence, the more often and the more steadily one reflects on them, the starry heavens above me and the moral law within me. I do not need to search for them and merely conjecture them as though they were veiled in obscurity or in the transcendent region beyond my horizon. I see them before me and connect them immediately with the consciousness of my existence. Kant recognizes his ability 
to comprehend both the starry heavens as well as the moral law that he finds within himself. And in fact, he finds his ability to understand these things to be something he is immediately aware of in his own consciousness. And furthermore, he also finds the fact that he can understand these things to be a cause for reverence. And I think it is very significant that Kant uses the word reverence here. That which we revere, that which deserves reverence, is that which we appreciate, hold in high regard, and give the deepest respect. Here then we see a first indication of why Kant believes the human being, the rational being, or the person, is a unique being that deserves to be respected. Kant finds wonder in his ability to understand the starry heavens above him and the moral law within him. It is these things which make the human being, both himself and others, an object of awe and reverence. But why is this? What is so special about the ability to recognize and understand these two phenomena? Let's begin by considering our understanding of the starry heavens. What is it that so amazes Kant about this? It is not merely the fact that he can see the stars in the sky. Presumably, many animals can look up into the night sky and see the stars. More fundamentally, it is the fact that human beings can, however imperfectly, conceptualize the starry heavens as existing at a great distance and even time from our observational viewpoint. It is the fact that contemplation of the starry heavens reveals to us that we occupy but one tiny corner of a vast universe. It is the fact that our wonder and awe at the vast expanse of space can make us ask deep and difficult metaphysical and existential questions. Questions like, what is the origin of the universe? Where did everything come from? What is the purpose of my life? Our ability to comprehend and contemplate the starry heavens is really just one example of a rather common phenomenon. What it shows is that we are capable of a level of abstract thought that is utterly unique to the human species and which pervades all aspects of our lives. The events in our lives are not just discrete events that occur randomly with no connection to one another. The human mind is not surrounded merely by particular and unique occurrences. Rather, to a human mind, these events are capable of taking on a much broader significance, and with our higher mental faculties, we are capable of understanding that significance in terms of broad and general abstract categories. Newton explains Kant's view that among these general categories are time, space, and causation. She says, normal adult human beings are able to consider abstract concepts, use language, and think in terms of categories, classes, and rules. Since Immanuel Kant, we have recognized three categories of thought that characterize the way human beings deal with the objects and events of the world. These are time, when did something happen in the past, present, future, how long did it take, duration, space, where is some object or how far away is it, location, both distance, and causation. How did something happen? What brought it about? Antecedents, agencies, powers, consequences. The creature that is rational will think on occasion in general terms about classes and laws extending over time, space, and possibility, while the creature that is not rational will think, if at all, only about particular individual objects or events. To see this point more clearly, let's consider a specific example. Imagine, for instance, that you feel a sharp pain in your finger after accidentally touching a hot stove. You do not conceive of this as merely an arbitrary or inexplicable event. The pain in your finger has to do with the fact that your finger and the stove met each other in space and time. They occupy the same place at the same time. In addition, you recognize that the stove is, in some sense, responsible for the pain in your finger. The pain was caused by the stove. So not only can we provide a deeper explanation for why the event occurred, but furthermore, we can notice its relationship to other events, and this is the most important point. Yesterday, for instance, you felt the pain of betrayal when you found out a friend lied to you. 
While the pain of touching a hot stove and the pain of betrayal each have their own unique flavor, each also share certain identifiable similarities. As such, we can place both of these events in the pain-causing events category. We can put them both in a more general category or more general characterization. And we can go even further than this. Given the natural attitude we take toward pain, we can engage in still further classification. If touching a hot stove and being betrayed by a friend each share the characteristic of causing pain, then each is also a prime candidate for being placed in the category of things that are bad for me. In this way, the distinctively human ability to think in terms of broad generalizations and categories gives a moral and ethical flavor to our world. The things that happen in our lives have some relationship to our flourishing and well-being, and because of our higher mental capabilities, we can categorize them in explicitly moral terms. Touching a hot stove and suffering betrayal are not just painful. These things are bad for me. And the reason we can recognize that they are bad for me is because we can think in, in general terms, in general categories that are made possible by our human reason and our higher human mental faculties. Kant emphasizes how the human mind is capable of thinking in terms of abstract categories like time, place, relation, causation, and possibility. But what does this have to do with ethics and morality? Kant's answer is that this higher capacity of the human mind is what permits us to recognize and understand the moral law within. To see this connection, let's consider another famous Kantian principle a principle known as the ought implies can principle. Kant states this principle in a number of different places, but the following is the formulation of it he gives in his book, Religion Within the Boundaries of Mere Reason. Kant says, For if the moral law commands that we ought to be better human beings now, it inescapably follows that we must be capable of being better human beings. The idea behind this principle is the following. If I say that you should do something, or if I say that you ought to do it, or that you have a moral duty to do it, then it must be the case that it is possible for you to do that thing. So if I say that you should give money to charity, then it must be the case that you have money to give. It must be the case that the charity in question exists. And it must not be the case that past causes have determined that you will not give to charity. You must have some degree of free will to choose to do the thing that I am saying that you must or should do. So to say that someone ought to do something implies that they can do that thing. This, of course, seems simply to be demanded as a matter of common sense and fairness. What is the point of commanding someone to do something that they are incapable of doing? How is it fair to hold someone responsible for a harm that it was not in their power to prevent? The ought implies can principle is meant to capture our basic intuitive answers to these kinds of questions. The thing to notice about the ought implies can principle is that it is meant to express a fundamental claim about the relationship between freedom and responsibility. A person is free if they can decide how to act among a set of choices or alternatives, and it is only those who are free, who can rationally decide how they will act, who we see as being responsible in a moral sense. A computer or a car may perform poorly or perform well, but it does not freely choose how it acts. It simply acts in the way it is programmed or constructed. So if our computer malfunctions or our car won't start, we don't hold it morally responsible for its failing. We don't criticize it or give it a prison sentence. At least, we don't do this if we're thinking clearly. However, the way we act toward human beings is very different from this. When a human being acts poorly, we do not simply chalk that up to how the person was programmed. Rather, we see that failing as issuing from that person's free choice. 
a failing for which that person must take responsibility and which may possibly subject her to blame or punishment. When a friend lies to us, for example, we think she should show remorse and apologize. Our natural response is not to discover the malfunction in her brain. So the fact that we hold human beings morally responsible, and the fact that we think human beings should act in various ways, seems to imply that we think human beings are free, that human beings can choose how they will act. This is the fundamental idea behind the ought implies can principle. Furthermore, this ability to freely choose how one will act depends upon the capability of the human mind to think in general abstract terms, the capability that Kant has identified as characterizing the nature of human reason. Specifically, our ability to choose freely depends upon our ability to consider different possibilities and alternatives for action, as well as make broad classifications of our actions based upon their typical consequences. Newton explains this point. She says, since people are rational, they can make rational choices. When people think about action, they think in terms of classes of acts as well as individual acts. For instance, if my neighbor has a particularly attractive knife, and I desire to take it from him, and am currently making plans to do so, I shall make my plans based on what I already know about all cases of people taking things from other people. And I can contemplate not only those past acts of taking, and the present plan to take that knife, but all cases that will ever be of taking, especially of knives, future acts as well as past and present acts. But in that case, I am thinking of action not yet taken, of action therefore undetermined, for which real alternatives exist. As a rational being, it is not predetermined that I will take my neighbor's knife. It is a choice that I have that I am free to reject, and in making this choice, I am aware of the consequences typically associated with that action. Furthermore, as a rational being, I am capable of resisting my natural and social instincts. Even if my natural psychological dispositions tempt me to steal something, or if I have been socially conditioned to think there's nothing wrong with theft, Kant believes human beings are still capable of stepping back, using our reason to assess the appropriate path of action, and acting against the pool of instinct if necessary. It is this ability which, in Kant's view, distinguishes human beings from all other animals. And again, we see Newton further explain this point. She states, since people can conceive of alternatives, they can choose among them. Having thought over the circumstances and deliberated on the outcomes, they can decide what to do. Put another way, I do not have to take that knife if I have not yet done it. People are free, as we say, or autonomous moral agents. But then they can also realize that they could have done differently. I do not have to take the knife, and given my neighbor's understandable grief and anger at its loss, maybe I should not have. That is, I can feel guilt and remorse and assume responsibility for having chosen as I did. One thing we should notice here is that Newton mentions how freedom can bring about feelings of guilt and remorse. Because we have the freedom to choose among various possibilities of acting, because our actions are not merely a matter of instinct, when we choose to act in a bad, evil, or morally wicked way, then we feel badly. Our conscience literally eats away at us. We don't just know that we have acted poorly. We know we could have done otherwise. We know the choice was up to us. And it is this knowledge which brings about regret, remorse, and guilt. To take a rather mundane and common example of this, we have all felt the pain of dedicating to a new diet and exercise regimen or study plan or maybe a more disciplined work schedule only to find ourselves falling back into precisely the old temptations of wasting time that we know are counterproductive and which we sought to avoid in the first place. Guilt and shame are the natural consequence of this all-too-human sequence of events. But it doesn't seem that such emotions would make sense if we had no ability for free choice, if our actions were predetermined. 
These emotions of guilt, shame, and remorse are the unique burden of the human species. Now, this might prompt us to consider a further question. Does our status as a rational being, which, remember, Kant says fills him with awe and wonder and reverence, does that status as a rational being really make us better off than other animal species? Or would, it be, or would we be better off if, like other animals, we simply allowed instinct to guide us in our lives? Does our ability to reason bring us benefits that outweigh the inevitable guilt, shame, and remorse that follow from our conscious awareness that we have made a bad decision? For Kant, rationality is what makes morality possible. Rationality makes us free and responsible in a moral sense for the decisions we make and the actions we take. Rationality is also necessary for morality in another important way. You might recall that previously we discussed Kant's principle of the categorical imperative. This principle states the following, Act only according to that maxim through which you can at the same time will that it become a universal law. Remember that the idea behind this principle is that it is only permissible for us to act in ways that it would be possible for everyone to act. If we act in a way that only works for us, if our action implicitly assumes that other people will not act this way as well, then we are acting as if we are special, as if we get to play by our own rules, and we consequently deny the fundamental equality of all people. As an example, Kant believed that it is always morally wrong to make a false promise. This is because it would be impossible to have a system in which everyone can make a promise they never intended to keep. When we act in this dishonest way, we take advantage of the social system of honesty that is upheld by everyone else. We act as a free rider or even a social parasite, so to speak. We should also notice that understanding and following the principle of the categorical imperative requires reason. Why is this? Well, first, notice that the principle of the categorical imperative talks about acting in a way that could serve as a universal law. The principle requires us to think not merely about what would be good for us to do, but it requires us to think about what rules and principles could govern the behavior of everyone. Furthermore, what is it that allows us to think in abstract terms, in terms of general laws and principles, instead of merely in terms of our distinctive desires or immediate self-interest? What capacity is it that human beings have which allows us to do this? The answer, of course, in Kant's view, is reason. A being without rationality could not understand the idea behind the categorical imperative and thus could not understand the basis of ethics and morality itself. For a non-rational being, the idea that acting in some particular way that is beneficial is still wrong because not everyone could act in that way would be incomprehensible. For example, you might be able to train a dog to limit the mess he makes while he eats. But you cannot, at least to my knowledge, explain to a dog how making a mess is wrong because it puts a burden on the rest of the family. You can't explain to a dog why making a mess is wrong because not everyone could act in precisely that way or we would have anarchy and chaos in the household. To understand those sorts of points, it takes the higher mental faculties of a human being. It takes the higher mental faculties of a human being to adopt this abstract, impartial point of view that takes into account the needs and interests of the whole. Newton explains this point by indicating how our ability to reason is what allows us to formulate general rules and expectations that govern an entire society, instead of merely thinking in terms of the personal rules that should govern our own actions. She states, as far as we know, we are alone among the animals in possession of this ability. Since people can conceive of classes of acts for which alternatives exist, they can make laws to govern acts in the future, specifying that the citizens or whoever may be bound by the law ought to act one way rather than another. No one, for instance, ought to take things that do not belong to them, and such takings henceforth, to be called theft, 
shall be collectively punished. General obligations can be formulated and articulated for a whole society. Collectively acting in their groups, people make collective choices, especially choices of rules, rather than relying on instinct. And they are then collectively responsible for those choices and individually responsible for abiding them. So what this means is that our very existence as a collective body governed by impartial rules that apply to everyone and for which we are subject to being responsible for if we break them is dependent upon our capacity for rationality. In Kant's view, the source of morality is human rationality. If no rational beings existed, then ethics itself wouldn't exist either. And this is because there wouldn't be any beings who could understand the idea of an ethical or moral duty. Now, because this is the case, Kant believes that human beings hold a fundamental importance and higher status, a status that is not shared by any other kind of being. Because the very existence of morality depends upon human beings, human beings, in Kant's view, deserve special moral consideration. As Newton points out, Kant believes that rational beings have an inherent moral dignity. She states, Persons are categorically different from the things of the physical world. They have dignity, inherent worth, rather than a mere price or dollar value. To better understand the idea that human beings have dignity, we can examine the following famous passage from Kant's groundwork to the metaphysics of morals. Here we see Kant distinguish those beings that have dignity from those beings that have a price. Kant tells us that everything has a, either a price or a dignity. What has a price can be replaced with something else as its equivalent, whereas what is elevated above any price and hence allows of no equivalent, has a dignity. The idea here is this. Everything that exists has some kind of value. In most cases, it is a kind of value that Kant refers to as a price. For things that have a price, the value of the thing is determined by how much it could be traded for at a fair market value, or how much it could be traded for without losing any overall value. For example, if I sell my car, then assuming I made a fair trade, I do not lose any value in the deal. The money I receive in return is supposed to equal the value of the car. So technically speaking, when I sell my car, I actually haven't lost anything. I have simply recovered the value of the car in a different form. Now, this matters because it shows that things with a price are exchangeable and replaceable. These material things may be useful, pleasing, attractive, and even capable of making us happy, but there will always be a situation in which it makes perfect sense to trade them away, throw them out, or even destroy them. The same cannot be said of things that have dignity. Kant tells us that such things are elevated above any price, and that they allow of no equivalent. If something has dignity, there is nothing it can be exchanged or traded for. It has no fair market value. It has an inherent value or self-worth that cannot be replaced by anything else. Here we might think of the idea that certain things are priceless. When we say that time spent with loved ones or the feeling of accomplishing our goals is priceless, we are certainly not saying that these things are worthless. Rather, we are saying that these things hold so much value, they hold a value that cannot be captured in monetary terms, no matter how much money we are talking about. It is this latter kind of value, the value of having dignity, that Kant believes applies to human beings. The human person, because the human person is a rational being, has dignity and inherent worth. And this worth does not depend upon how useful or happy or athletic or artistic, emotionally sensitive or intelligent that person is. The human being is simply priceless. This idea, the idea that human beings have dignity, explains many of our common moral intuitions and underlies the concept of human rights 
in which human beings have certain rights merely in virtue of being human. And these rights do not depend upon one's sex or race or religion or age or political affiliation, sexual orientation, or any other demographic fact that can separate human beings. It also explains why parents see it as a horrific tragedy if one of their children dies, even if they have other children already or decide to have more in the future. And of course, this is because each human being has inherent worth, inherent dignity. Again, each human being is priceless. Now, all of this assumes that the human person has an inherent value that simply does not depend upon any particular characteristic or trait that he or she may or may not possess. Furthermore, we should recall that the reason humans have dignity and the special moral status that goes along with it is because without the rational capacities of human beings, without our ability to reason and reflect and to think in terms of broad, general, abstract categories and to think in an impartial and selfless, and selfless way, without our ability to do that, morality would not exist in the first place. And so because human beings are uniquely necessary for the existence of morality, human beings, in Kant's view, get the benefit of a special moral status and special moral consideration. The claim that human beings have dignity is meant to express the idea that human beings are not mere things or objects that we can use or manipulate as we wish. Newton explains this point. She states, they, beings with dignity, are bearers of rights and subjects of duties rather than mere means to our ends or obstacles to our purposes. Kant expresses this idea in what is known as his principle of humanity. And the principle of humanity states, so act that you use humanity in your own person as well as in the person of any other, always at the same time as an end, never merely as a means. The principle of humanity prohibits us from treating persons as mere things, from treating persons as mere means to achieving our ends, from treating persons in the way we might treat a tool. For example, we think there's no problem using a hammer or car or computer as mere tools for achieving our purposes. We use a hammer to nail a piece of wood, a car to get to work, and a computer to do our taxes. And at no point do we feel that we need to get the permission of the hammer, car, or computer. After all, these things are not persons. They are just things. But if we are dealing with a person, then acting in this way would be completely inappropriate. If we want a person to build a table or give us a ride to work or do our taxes, then we need to get their permission. We may persuade them to do so through reason or pay them for their effort or point out that it is their moral obligation but we cannot force them to do our bidding. This would be a clear violation of the principle of humanity. It would be tantamount to treating a rational person like a material object. As such, we can see how the principle of humanity explains why slavery, for example, is such a horrible moral evil. To enslave another person is to fail to respect their status as a rational person. It is, again, to treat a person like a thing. Or, to put it in Kant's terminology, this would be to treat a person as a mere means to an end, or as a mere tool for getting what we want. The fundamental moral value expressed by the principle of humanity is respect. Respect for our fellow human being. But what does it mean to show respect? To answer this question, we might first ask, how is respect different from other positive attitudes we take toward another person? Attitudes such as liking someone or loving someone. Well, respect is always a recognition of the status of another individual. There are many examples of this. Students know they should be quiet when the teacher is talking. The courtroom stands when the judge enters the room. And in the military, those of lower rank salute those of higher rank. All of these are examples, both practical and symbolic, of the way we acknowledge the status of another person. There is a further important point to note about each of these examples. In each case, it is possible to show respect for the individual in question, even if we do not like that person, love them, or have any real positive feelings towards them. 
A student might remain quiet while the teacher is lecturing despite not enjoying the class. A defendant can hate the judge that sends him to prison while also acknowledging that the sentence is fair and deserved. The soldier of lower rank can respect his commanding officer even if he finds him to be burdensome or even incompetent. The point here is this. Respect is unique in that we can respect those we dislike, are annoyed by, would not want to be friends with, and even those we hate. Why is this? Well, it is because respect doesn't have anything to do with our particular relationship to the individual in question. We do not respect other people because we find them fascinating, because we have a strong familial bond, or because we enjoy being around them. We respect others because of the status they have earned, and as a sign of respect, our behavior toward them must acknowledge that status. Kant claims that all human beings have dignity and deserve respect. However, the kind of respect Kant is talking about here is somewhat different from what we saw in the previously mentioned examples. In all those cases, the individual in question had a special status in virtue of his or her rank in some social system, like a school, the legal system, or the military. Yet Kant's point is that in addition to whatever social status we might justly earn, there is a status that is warranted of all human beings merely because they are human. To say that human beings have dignity is to say that they have a special status not shared by anything else in the universe. And it is this status which the principle of humanity demands that we respect. Now, Kant is not saying that we have a duty to engage in symbolic displays of respect toward each other every time we see someone. We do not need to salute everyone we pass by on the sidewalk, for instance. So what kind of behavior is demanded by the virtue of the dignity that all human beings possess? For an answer, we should return to the principle of humanity. Recall that this principle prohibits treating another human as a mere means to an end. And the qualifying word mere in that phrase is vitally important. Consider the following example. Suppose I go to the store and I use the cashier as a means of purchasing groceries. Have I violated the principle of humanity? Well, no. The principle does not say we can never use others as a means to our end. It says we cannot use others merely as a means to our end. We cannot act in a way that seems to assume the other person does not have reason, a will, desires, interests, and the capacity to make their own decisions. It is when we act in this way that we fail to show respect for someone's status as a rational being. To put the point more concretely, the principle allows us to use other people as a means to our end, provided they have given their autonomous consent. So if the cashier has freely agreed to work at the store and has not been coerced or forced to do so, then we do not show them disrespect by using them to purchase our groceries for the week. But why think that respect for another requires respecting another's free choices? Newton explains this point. She says, as freedom of choice is the characteristic that sets humans apart from the other animals, if we have any duty to respect human beings at all, it is this choice that we must respect. Our duty of respect for persons or respect for persons as autonomous beings requires that we allow others to be free to make their own choices and live their own lives. Especially, we are required not to do anything to them without their consent. The reason humans warrant respect in the first place is because human beings are rational and thus human beings are free. Human beings can make their own autonomous decisions. Thus, just like respect requires remaining quiet for the teacher, standing for the judge, or saluting the military officer, Respect for our fellow human being requires allowing our fellow human beings to exercise their capacity for autonomous choice. It requires permitting people to make their own choices in accordance with their own values without being subject to force, coercion, or manipulation. To respect a human being, then, is to respect human freedom.
The value of respect for persons, which is so prominently emphasized in Kant's ethical theory, is also one of the three Belmont principles, along with beneficence and justice. Recall that these principles were outlined as regulations to guide conduct and biomedical research on human subjects. Now, in fact, the Belmont Report identifies two separate requirements that constitute the duty to respect persons. One, the requirement to acknowledge autonomy, and two, the requirement to protect those with diminished autonomy. Here we are going to consider how each of these requirements plays a role in medical practice. Let's begin by considering the first requirement, the requirement to acknowledge autonomy. Respecting persons requires understanding and appropriately responding to their status as a rational being. And one thing this means is that we must permit those who are fully autonomous to make their own autonomous decisions and shape their lives as they see fit. In medical practice, this has important implications for the way in which physicians interact with their patients. In his book, Complications, a surgeon's notes on an imperfect science, the surgeon Atul Gawande recounts how in the past, medical professionals often disregarded the desires and wishes of their patients. Gawande describes how doctors did not consult with patients about their desires and priorities and routinely withheld information, sometimes crucial information, such as what drugs they were on, what treatments they were being given, and what their diagnosis was. Patients were even forbidden to look at their own medical records. It wasn't their property, doctors said. They were regarded as children, too fragile and simple-minded to handle the truth, let alone make decisions, and they suffered for it. We can see how such an attitude constitutes a violation of patient autonomy. In order for a person to make an autonomous decision, that person needs access to the relevant information. Otherwise, her deliberation about what to do is seriously hampered. How can a patient decide what course of treatment would best fit into her life plan if she does not know what, the options, what options are available as well as the risks and benefits associated with each of those options? However, it is also important to recognize when someone's circumstances prevent them from making fully autonomous decisions. The effects of mental deterioration, emotional distress, anxiety, depression, or physical confinement can make it impossible for one to engage in rational deliberation and free action. These conditions can prevent people from making choices that are in line with their considered values, prevent them from thinking clearly about what would be in their best interests. It is a simple fact of life for everyone that at various times and for a wide variety of reasons, we may not be in a position where we are capable of thinking rationally about how to act, or at least our ability to do so may be significantly hampered. This brings us to the second requirement of respecting persons identified in the Belmont Report, the requirement to protect those with diminished autonomy. In cases of diminished autonomy, Showing respect for persons requires that we acknowledge the fact that a person's autonomy has been diminished and seek to protect those who are incapable of protecting themselves. As an example of diminished autonomy that is relevant to the ethics of medical research, the Belmont Report mentions the use of prisoners as subject for research experiments. The report identifies the following tension. On the one hand, it would seem that the principle of respect for persons requires that principles not be deprived of the opportunity to volunteer for research. On the other hand, under prison conditions, they may be subtly coerced or unduly influenced to engage in research activities for which they would not otherwise volunteer. Respect for persons would then dictate that prisoners be protected. So it may seem that respecting autonomy would imply that prisoners should be offered the choice of being a participant in medical research studies. After all, doesn't more choice equal more freedom? Well, in some cases, yes. But it is also important to be sensitive to the circumstances under which a given choice will be made. You have probably all experienced this in your personal lives at some point. Say there is something you would like a friend or family member to do for you. Say you would like them to loan you some money or give you a ride to work. Imagine also that you know the very act of asking them to do this will place pressure on them to agree. 
maybe they feel as if they have no real choice, right? Isn't that what a good friend, brother, sister, or parent is supposed to do? And if that's the case, then they might feel like, how can I say no? So if you know that making such a request will make them feel pressured to agree to what you want, then could it be possible that the request itself fails to respect their autonomy? Respecting another's autonomy requires making sure we do not coerce or manipulate others to do what we want. And this, in turn, requires thinking about the circumstances in which someone will be deliberating about what to do. If we know that putting someone in a given situation will cause them to feel compelled to act in a certain way, then perhaps respecting their autonomy demands we not put them in that situation in the first place. And so a similar point applies here. Given the severely diminished autonomy of those in prison, presenting them with the option to be a research participant might be seen as something that they are not really at liberty to reject. As the Belmont, point, as the Belmont report points out, they may feel subtly coerced into participating, and as such, their participation in the study would not have issued from their own free choice. This would, of course, be problematic insofar as respect for a person is supposed to be respect for their ability to make rational, free, and autonomous choices about how to live their lives. In other cases, the cause of diminished autonomy may have less to do with physical constraints or one's external circumstances. Rather, the cause of diminished autonomy may have more to do with one's psychological state. The Belmont Report points out that not every human being is capable of self-determination. The capacity for self-determination matures during an individual's life, and some individuals lose this capacity wholly or in part because of illness, mental disability, or circumstances that severely restrict liberty. Respect for the immature and the incapacitated may require protecting them as they mature or while they are incapacitated. There are situations in which, either temporarily or permanently, a person lacks the mental capacities to make rational decisions for themselves. We recognize this is the case with children, but it can also be the case for adults for a wide variety of reasons. In such circumstances, the responsibility falls upon others to protect those who lack full autonomy. To see an example of this in medical practice, we can consult an example that Gawande uses in his book, Complications. Here he describes the case of a man he refers to as Mr. Howe. Mr. Howe had undergone an operation for an infected gallbladder and was facing serious complications as a result of pneumonia. The doctors wanted to place him on a breathing machine for a few days and were confident that doing so would save his life. However, Mr. Howe refused to be placed on the machine. He was, we believed, making a bad decision. Out of fear, maybe incomprehension, with antibiotics and some high-tech support, we had every reason to believe he'd recover fully. How had a lot to live for? He was young and otherwise healthy, and he had a wife and a child. Apparently he thought so too, for he cared enough about his well-being to accept the initial operation. If not for the terror of the moment, we thought, he would have accepted the treatment. Could we be certain we were right? No, but if we were right, could we really just let him die? Eventually, Mr. Howe fell into unconsciousness, and the doctors put him on the breathing machine without his permission. The following was Howe's reaction upon waking up. I stood there silent and anxious for a moment, waiting to see what he would say. He swallowed hard, wincing from the soreness. Then he looked at me, and in a hoarse but steady voice, he said, Thank you. It may be tempting to think that we should always respect the free choices of other people, and to be sure, much harm has been done from failing to respect freedom of choice. However, it is also important to recognize when someone is not capable of an autonomous choice. It is important to recognize that there are circumstances we are all at risk of falling into where we cannot clearly see what is best for us. The case of Mr. Of Mr. Howe is a perfect example of this. His temporary fear and terror and anxiety prevented him from choosing an option of treatment that was clearly best for him in the long run, and not clearly best for him as determined by the doctors or anyone else, 
but clearly best for him as determined by his own values. The best thing for him to do would be to undergo the operation. Even if he couldn't see it at that moment, you can imagine his future self, and in fact we have his testimony here, you can imagine his future self saying, this is clearly what I would want to do if I was thinking clearly. Now in such cases, perhaps Kant's dictum to show respect for persons needs a little bit of re reinterpretation. Is it really respectful to allow someone who lacks the capacity to adequately weigh evidence and engage in rational de deliberation to fall into ruin and self-harm? Yes, human beings are rational, and for that reason it is important that we respect their choices. At the same time, human beings are vulnerable and at risk of not thinking clearly about decisions that are critical for their life and well-being. Perhaps what this shows is that respect for autonomy is blind and incomplete if it is not accompanied by compassion, care, and the principle of beneficence. 